Ever since I started skateboarding, my dream was to interview Steve Rocco. Steve was a professional skateboarder, specifically a freestyler, and he was one of the best, battling people like Rodney Mullen in contests throughout the 70s and 80s. He was also one of the first skaters to have a street style model board. But what he's most known for today is creating the modern day skateboard industry. He's kind of like the architect. His brand, World Industries, spearheaded the street skating movement with some of the best skaters around at the time who innovated new board shapes, ways to do business, and helped create the fuck you attitude that skating still champions today. I think kids like the fact that we talk to them like eye level. Every popular brand steals from Steve Rocco's playbook. The problem is, you can't just go and interview Steve. He's kind of a mythical creature. Since Steve sold his company in 2002, he's mostly been living off the grid. I had heard various rumors that he was living in Malibu or playing the stock market, but I wasn't really sure. In 2018, I kind of got lucky and a friend shared Steve Rocco's number with me. But when I called, he never responded. Over a couple of years, I'd call him, hoping for a random chance to get through. But then one time, it actually happened. Yeah, hi, this is Steve Rocco. Somebody was calling me from this number. Hey, Steve, this is uh, Ian. I, uh, my name's uh, Ian Mishnah. I do a skate magazine called Jenkum. I hit you up probably in 2017. This is a total cold call, obviously. And I know you like your privacy, but there's any way in hell I could motivate you to do an interview or go surfing with you or something like that for the mag. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm already, I'm in New Zealand. Oh, you're already in New Zealand. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, Turns out the reason Steve called me back was because he thought I was the Tesla dealership, but I was just happy to get him on the line. Well, I'm just trying to figure out what, what, what's, your, what's your idea and what are, you, what are you trying to accomplish? Yeah, no, great, great, great questions. I wasn't even expecting you to pick up the phone, so I wasn't, you know, I was like, oh shit, okay, he's here, great. I know you guys have done Man Who Sold the World, and I know you've done Dumb. Someone like me is curious, like, you kind of got the dream, you had a cool company, you sold it, you made some money, you're able to retire. So is the ending happy? Like, what are you doing now? Is, is it boring? Is it challenging? That sort of stuff. Well, first of all, the man who sold the world wasn't supposed to be about me. It was supposed to be about the industry. So I was not really happy with what they did. After the call, I was hopeful. Although he was moving to New Zealand, I felt like if I drafted up the right pitch and he was in the right mood, I might be able to interview him after all. I even asked Rodney Mullen to put in the good word for me, and he emailed Rocco with an extra vote of confidence in my abilities. But after a couple more emails back and forth, it fizzled. But then, one year later, miraculously, Steve decided to resurface in the industry. He was gonna help Sidewalk Distribution, the home of brands like Jacuzzi and Slappy Trucks. I couldn't believe it. After 22 years, he decided to come back to skating. I was kind of confused, but I finally had my chance. I connected with Sidewalk Distribution and asked if I could help tell their story. After a bunch of prep and multiple Zoom calls, we were able to make it happen. Yeah. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Can you see me okay? Yeah, no, you look good. You must have had a, um, what's it called, a stylist come over before. I, I did. You know me. It's, it's all about, it's all about presentation. So I'm just going to jump into it. Um, after all the years, why now, basically? Well, if somebody doesn't tell the truth now, it'll be buried forever. Mm -hmm. From what happened in, you know, between like 1987 to say 1993, um, it, it was a part of skateboarding that really changed everything. I believed street skating was going to be huge. My passion for it, I think, came through in telling other people. And my idea that we can have a company based on street skating was something I believed in. It's not like I went up to Tony Hawk and go, Tony, dude, you got to, you know, quit riding vert and, and start doing this. I mean, that was not my mission. My mission was to take guys that were already doing it, guys like, you know, Jeremy Klein and stuff that I'd see at contests and go, hey, would you like to work with us and try to make better stuff and better products? And the same with Rodney and everybody else. It was more of a movement. You got the So other people have been telling your stories. So is there something specifically, you know, younger generation like me, we grew up with Man Who Sold the World and most recently Dumb, which is about Big Brother and World. What did they get wrong? 
it's not like I'm some like evil genius, like, you know, taking over everything and had it all planned out. Um, we just got fucking lucky. I'm so glad you said that because <laughs> my question is from there, like, do you worry about tarnishing your legacy? Because people think you're an evil genius that had it all planned out, you know, from that type of stuff. <laughs> Number one, my, my legacy is tarnished. I mean, already there's just no untarnishing it. Um, they can, they can try to gloss it up or whatever, but, um, uh, you're trying to tarnish the legacy of a sport that is inherently tarnished. When I started my company, do you actually think I thought it would turn into what it was? I wanted to make skateboards that we could ride with graphics that meant something to us personally. I thought we were all, dude, it's all cool. Look, we all have skateboard companies. Yay. That's how stupid I was and naive. You know, George, pal, you're going to run a full page ad making fun of small companies. You know, you're going to get kicked in the balls, dude. Since you're doing it to me, I'm going to do it to you in a way you've never seen done before. If I knew what I knew today and wanted to start a skateboard company, I would I would be telling myself, oh, don't even try. There's no fucking way you can pull that off. You have a cash adventure dollar credit card and turn it into 50 something million dollars you might as well go buy lottery tickets <laughs> i was too stupid to know when i started what i was trying to do was virtually impossible so what are you going to be doing with sidewalk like what is your role there you know i think i can just give perspective on stuff um especially because they're going to be doing some of the reissues and the heritage of skateboarding each of those graphics that we came out with, they have an amazing story behind them. And it's not just my story. It's the story of the artist. It's the story of the skater. You know, it's a story of, you know, what we had to do to make that shape. You know, Animal Farm is a great example of Rodney taking freestyle and street skating together with a symmetrical double kick board. If you can actually define seminal moments, like moments that change the sport forever, that shape alone where you could do a land a trick 180 and you're still your board is still the same board you know that that did not exist i think this is a great time you know to you know mend some fences and go look we were all young we were all stupid and we were all just trying to do stuff that we thought was fun and we had disagreements and um Maybe it's time to let those bygones be bygones and you can tell your story. I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise. I'll tell my story. Mark and Pahim would tell his story. And, um, you know, it's a fun thing for people to realize, like, um, the process that was involved in doing some of these things that changed, you know, skateboarding. As you've gotten older, do you think you would have done anything different, like giving some of the younger riders, you know, strippers, access to a lot of capital, stuff like that? You know, it's it's hard to have regrets, but at the same time, it's hard to be proud. You know, I'll just put it this way. One of my favorite quotes is that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And um, I did a lot of paving with good intentions, not realizing that that road led to hell. <laughs> I grew up as a skater being told that skaters are dumb. They can't have their own companies. They're not good for anything but skating. I know what it felt to be treated like that. I didn't get to stay at the same hotels and have to stay at shitty, like, you know, holiday inns while the owners are staying in, like, all this stuff. 
I, you know, promised myself if I ever had a company, I would treat the skaters like, like royalty. And I did, but I didn't see the repercussions of what would happen. Maybe I should have paid more attention um, when I read Lord of the Flies in high school. So <laughs> have you talked with Rick and Mike and seen them around since, you know, the last 30 years? For those who don't know, Rick Howard and Mike Carroll and a bunch of other riders left Rocco's brands to start their own brand, Girl Skateboards, in 1993. No, I talked to Guy and um, Eric Cost, and I ran into them at the barracks six, seven years ago, and I thought it was going to be so awkward. And they were so nice to me. And they had just started this company. I said, dude, you're good with numbers. Can you help us out? And I go, oh, yeah, I could totally help you out. I'm good at this, but Rodney is the guy you should be talking to because like numbers are, you know, his life. And um, I remember Guy saying, like, when I look back on skating, those were the happiest days of my life being on the blind team. And uh, that meant a lot to me. Um, Rick. I think I ran into him between 1998 and 2000, something like that. Seven, eight years have gone by or whatever since I did their thing and left. I just remember going up to him and just going, dude, I really, really want to thank you so much for everything you've done for me. And he just sat there with like this look on his face. He goes, like, what do you mean? And I go, you know, if you guys didn't leave, and, and do what you did, I would still be having to do that thing. What's it called? Um, work, work. That's it. That's the thing. Work. <laughs> you know, that you do every day. I go, I'd still having to be do that. But because of you, I don't have to do that anymore. Like, so thank you. <laughs> After the guys left, World Industries came out with Flame Boy and Wet Willie. The popularity of these graphics eventually led to the sale of the company for $29 million. Do you still hold resentment against those guys or you think it's worn off over the years? The only resentment I hold, not that they left. It was just the manner that they did it and sort of the propaganda that is still out there about why they did it. Other than that, you know, it doesn't do you any good to just go around resenting everything. And, and, and in reality, it did help me get to where I got. Does it bother you that... Um you as a business person overshadows you as a skater to generations that came after you? I don't know. It sort of did. And that's why I never joined the Hall of Fame when they wanted to induct me as an icon, I guess. It was like I didn't even exist as a skater. And clearly that video clip I sent you, um, that's a switch stance 360 kickflip, right? You show me one other person in the history of skateboarding that did that. But here's the amazing thing about that. I couldn't do kickflips the other way. I had to do a regular foot. So people will go, oh my God, that's amazing. Steve's, Steve's doing it's switch stance. And Rodney's like, no, he's not. He's just fucked up. He doesn't even know what stance he is. And nobody even listened to him. And to me, it was great. That's why I love Rodney so much. It's just, you know, he knew. I mean, once we got to know how each other skated, um, we knew our strengths and weaknesses, like right off the bat. Rodney, you know, he's credited for inventing a lot of the flat ground tricks, which he did, but you still think he's still underrated. He deserves more credit for inventing the current type of skating we're doing now. There's two types of geniuses. There's regular geniuses, and then there's what are peerless geniuses, geniuses without peer. Um, in like 1905, Einstein had no rival. In skateboarding, there are geniuses. There are the Tony Hawks and the Mark Gonzalez's. But I think Rodney is more of a peerless genius. You know, once he passed me out, there's nothing but blue sky. What I think is the amazing thing about what he did is not what he did. It's how he did it. That is what blows me away. To change a whole sport quietly by yourself doing what you love doing. That is what he does not get enough credit for. After a few more Zooms with Steve, I still had questions. I hit him up to talk again, but he said he was actually headed to Hawaii. And if I wanted to, I could finish the interview there. Hawaii is definitely far, but it's a lot closer than New Zealand. So I said, fuck it, and I booked the ticket. Steve's 
Steve invited me over to Reggie Barnes's house, another freestyler from back in the day. These guys really do run the industry. Is this in the way, or? Yeah, it's better a little further out than that. Perfect, yeah. Hi, my name is Steve. I have been in the skateboard industry for a, a long time. Skateboarding has been very, very good to me. Like, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time here. When I retired from the skateboard industry, even before that, um, I've just always come here as a place to just sort of get away from it all. What have you been enjoying most in the last 20 years? What have you been filling your time with? Oh my God. Um, I basically have spent 20 years um, hanging out in Malibu, learning to surf, um, diving, spear fishing, um, teaching my daughter, like, you know, just everything and watching her learn and become like an amazing person teaching her something. And then two months later, she can kick my ass at it. And you're just like, this is not happening. I'm getting fucking beaten at Connect Four by a, a 10 year old. Yeah, and then just learning and reading and learning and reading. I've been 20 years of university. All the stuff that Rodney would challenge me with is every, every conversation with him, you know, you tell him what you think and he has that really nice way of, Steve, that's great. You're trying to learn this and boy, you know, like, you know, it's really admirable, but here's where you're wrong and you really should look up this and, um, you know, that, that, it's like poking the bear and so I'd go jump back in. I knew he liked competition, so I brought some board games to play on the island and hopefully break the tension a little bit. All right, so what are we playing for? What, what do you come, what, a hundred bucks? Usually we play for companies. <laughs> well, I can't. So I don't have a company anymore, so I'll put up 100 grand. And if I win, I think a company would be willing to get 100 grand. Ready? I mean, I'm not going to agree to it, but I like the theory. I'm not as good as you. How do you know? We didn't wait. wait. <laughs> you know, I, I'm really interested in like, didn't you miss skating when you left? Yeah, I miss definitely the camaraderie of my friends. There was a lot of things I didn't miss, the infighting in the industry all of that, um, because it was just, it was just so beneath everything that we were. I mean, people look at us as being crazy, whatever, but deep down we were, we were actually um, deep thinkers and, and real philosophical debates took place and, um, you know, all in trying to extract the truth or you know, or, or show what skating's really about in a very sometimes humorous way or an honest way or just a different way. Um, so it's a complicated question with a complicated answer and yes and no. I'll never forget, you know, Rodney knew how to play chess and so we used to play speed chess and every time you move, you get five seconds. But basically I gave Rodney my queen to start and, um, Rodney had me, I was done. You know, I had like almost no pieces left, but Rodney had used up most of his time. But so I go, Rodney, all you have to do is move anything and you'll get five seconds, you know? So just make a move. He goes, how do I know this I go, there are no wrong moves. Just, but he, he can't make the move and his clock expired and he lost the game. Rodney, when he has to make a tough decision, freezes, but, it also really showed me how much thought he loved to put into stuff and give it enough time. Um, you know, Rodney could see through a brick wall, but when you put pressure on him, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's fun to toy with him like that. I mean, getting to toy with guys that are geniuses and have them toy back with you, that's the shit I miss I because you don't appreciate it at the time how special it is. Only when you have 20 years of hanging out with people that are not, 
that gifted? Do you realize how gifted the people you hung out were just like in another league? It's the little moments like that, you know, where you come up with an idea on Monday, you come into work, you give it to Mark McKee. By lunchtime, he's got a pencil sketch. You walk over to JT at the computer. I go, hey, can you put this in line art in Adobe? No problem. You know, like, wow. Well, then, you know, next day is like, show me some color comps, break it down. Lunchtime comes. I'm like, I love it. Can you run some separations on it? Hand them to the guy in the, making the screens. I go, hey, make four screen, you know, make these screens right now. And, um, you know, let's print a shirt. On the weekend, I'm skating down the strand and I see a kid wearing a shirt that a week ago only existed in my brain. And yeah, that is pretty cool. Skateboarding, from a technical standpoint, from like what skateboarding is, I don't think skateboarding's ever been better off than it is right now. It's like combining all the difficulty and consistency that Rodney did with freestyle skateboarding and that go big or go home, skate or die attitude of Thrasher, all of that into one thing where these guys are doing all this amazing stuff that used to take 50 tries to get it once, but they're doing it every time. And for me, as somebody growing up where you had to do stuff every time or you lose a contest, that's amazing. Um, from an industry point, you know, despite having what I feel is a legacy of letting skaters have their own companies and make their own decisions and doing all of that, skateboarding somehow as an industry is doing horribly. And I haven't even figured out why. There's too many reasons probably to even go into it right now, but Sidewalks, they've asked for my help. And if I can help, I'd like to. Um, but I don't want to tell anybody my plans for the future because it's just going to make God laugh. So I have no idea at this point. I'm going to do my best. Do you have any advice for um, younger people that are trying to start companies? You know, it's kind of hard, I guess, to kind of give a one-size-fits-all answer, but is there anything that follows up? There actually is a one-size-fits-all answer for something like this. Make shit you like, that you believe in, and sell the rest of it, and, and see if kids like it. That's all, that's all you got to do.